Blog Talk Radio. We are the You Are Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good afternoon and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I don't know if you guys can hear it in my voice. I have been kind of laid up with a head cold the past few days. It has not stopped me from playing tennis, however, and I'm happy to report that even sick, I was able to bring home two wins in my last two matches, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that, but... <laughs> I apologize if my voice is coming across a little differently than normal this week, and uh, please bear with me. We have a phenomenal show for you this week. Our guest, Bob Litwin, went from being a decent tennis player to a 17-time U.S. national champion, an eight-time member of the U.S. Senior Davis Cup, U.S. PTA National Senior Player of the Year. So um, kind of good credentials for this, for this gentleman. His career was highlighted by winning the ITF World Championships and being ranked number one in the world in the 55 and over. And then he was indu- inducted into the Eastern Tennis Hall of Fame. He was the host of Tennis Talk Online for USA Network for four French and four U.S. Open tournaments. And business-wise, he went from being a club tennis teacher and then turning that into an amazing business where now he coaches masters of business, hedge funds, and all other industries, including lawyers, doctors, dentists, industrialists, people in finance, and athletes at all levels from high school to collegiate to professional. He's got an an amazing endorsement from 39-time Grand Slam champion Billie Jean King he, she says about Bob, Bob has taken his powerful teachings off the court to make a greater impact in the world of business and life. He's working on a new book that will be released next year. It's called Live the Best Story of Your Life, A World Champion's Guide to Lasting Change. So I am pleased to bring on the air with us today, Mr. Bob Litwin. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm thrilled to be on the show Well, it's going to be a good one today, and to my listeners, I know if you were following me on Facebook or Twitter these last few days, you saw my post about Bob and talking about storytelling, and you might be wondering what storytelling has to do with junior tennis and being a junior tennis parent, but I assure you, Bob will explain that concept to us. Right, Bob? Oh, I absolutely will. You are all about storytelling, and um, as you and I were chatting before we went live, I told you that today's Parenting Aces post was a bit about me changing my internal story as a tennis parent and how that kind of impacted me this past weekend. And so for those of you who haven't seen Parenting Aces today, um, I hope you'll take a look and read that. But, Bob, I'm going to just jump right in with some questions, and one of the things that has been discussed over and over lately is kind of the lack of top junior players coming out of the U.S. We seem to have all these phenomenal coaches, and I've actually had several of them as guests on this show, and yet, you know, we just don't seem to be making a dent in the world stage. And I want to ask you, why do you think we have so few top players coming out of our junior program? Well, interestingly, when we we met, I do have an echo. I don't know if you're hearing that. I am not hearing it. You're sounding good to me. Okay. So, um, you know, we met at Tennis Congress USA about a month or two ago, and 
there were so many great coaches there. And yet what was very interesting was that people seemed to be getting a lot of benefit and improving in their games, you included, by working with specialists, like in particular in the areas where you needed work. Um, and, and what it, it demonstrated to me is that something about our model seems to be broken. I mean, certainly our results indicate that something is broken. And what struck me was that all of us who teach tennis are basically generalists. Um, and yet each of us is very, very strong in some particular area. So if you wanted to learn about footwork down at Tennis Congress, you went over to where Emilio Sanchez was. But if you wanted to learn about mental training, you didn't really ask Emilio Sanchez, even though he could address it. And if you wanted to ask about footwork, you wouldn't come to me, even though as a tennis teacher I can teach footwork. So to me there's some question right now about where people are going in order to really develop their games. And I just wonder at this point if maybe we should be looking at our industry in the same way as, say, the medical field works, which is, hey, if you've got a broken arm, you go to an orthopedist, you don't go to a general surgeon. So um, I think that there's a problem with the model. Uh, also, I think there's something that's shaky about the story itself. I mean, the story that we've been telling for so many years has to do with lots of drills lots of one-on-one -on -one instruction. And yet, as Jimmy Arias was talking about during the uh, year-end uh, matches last week, he was saying when we were growing up, we were playing a lot of matches. That's how we got familiar with how to deal with situations that we were faced with in matches themselves. We didn't get good at drills because being good at drills didn't necessarily make us good competitors. So I, I just have a feeling that we have to take another strong look at what our model is. I know Patrick McEnroe and the whole crew is out there doing that, but we haven't seemed to come up with the answer. Um, I'd like to see kids spending more time playing matches. On the weekends when they don't have tournaments, play matches. Two out of three sets, whatever it takes. And that's an interesting point, and it's it's actually one that my son and I have been talking about a lot. My son is 17, and um, and we've been talking about how difficult it is to arrange match play because, at least in Atlanta, and, and this is really the only community I can speak to with any type of real knowledge, um, here there are so many coaches and so many, quote, academies. And the academies really stick unto themselves. So even though my son has friends that train at other places, if he calls them up for a practice match, the likelihood is they're not going to want to do that. And I don't know if, you know, it's because they feel they're being disloyal to their coach or they don't want to miss drills or they don't want to miss their private lessons. Um, but it is very challenging. And so I'm, I'm really kind of relieved to hear you say that we need to get back to that because I've been preaching that gospel for a while too and I think it's time that, that these coaches start paying attention to that and making it more more um, accessible, the match play, more accessible to these kids. Whatever happened to challenge ladders? Where? Why did those go away? Well, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I know this is a show about tennis parents as well and I think that uh, again the story that that is out there right now is one of uh, let's let's keep a secret the way in which my son or daughter is getting better if there is a good coach working with my kid I don't want that coach working with a competitor and and there's just something about that that doesn't really address the idea of we want everybody to be good because it makes us better I had a particular uh, client who was an amazing runner, a uh, high school track star. And I was working with her on her mental game. She had somebody in her own school who was struggling, and she suggested to this friend of hers, why don't you talk to Bob? So the mom of the second kid called me and said, will you work with my daughter? I said, sure. 
Then I got a call from the mom of the first kid who said, I don't want you working with her because I don't want her to start winning over my daughter. Wow. And Yeah, I mean, but look, I'm not telling you something that's not going on in the tennis world. This goes on a lot. I mean, as a mental trainer, I'm faced with this frequently, that people want to keep it a secret. Right, and and I mean, honestly, that was the impetus behind me starting Parenting Aces, was because I couldn't get the information from the other parents. I was asking, believe me, you've met me, you know I'm not shy, and I couldn't, nobody would share. And so I was like, well, okay, then I'll gather it, and I'll be the sharer, you know, I'm okay with that. (laughs) I mean, I, I want my kid to get better, of course. And I want him to have every opportunity, of course. But I know that there's benefit in us all getting better together and pushing each other to that next level. Well, look, Lisa, there's an overemphasis on winning in junior sports. And that that is a real negative in people growing as players. Um, they don't do what they need to do when they're competing because – they can win an old way, they can push to win, or they can, um, wh- whatever they do to win, they tend to stay with, and the fear of trying new things is there in matches. And, you know, and I understand that because I love winning also. But the emphasis that goes on, especially in the tennis world, is, is, is really a negative to kids improving. So somehow we, again, need to shift the story from rankings from uh, wins, from thinking about college when the kids are 14 and 15 years old, to development, to process. And uh, I had written a blog recently that addressed this. When I was in Tennis Congress, I was talking about the story of process versus winning. And Jeff Greenblatt was there. He's the number one in the world in the 35s and 45s. And we really were like, the only ones in the room who were saying, yeah, process is what it's about. The winning is, is wonderful, but it's not the main thing. Mm-hmm. And and I'll tell you, Billie Jean King, many years ago, I was at a conference she was uh, giving, and she said, all you tennis coaches, keep reminding your clients it's not about the wins, it's about the journey, it's about the people you meet, it's about the places you go, but most importantly, it's about the effort, the growth, the adversity that you've dealt with, that's really what matters. And I, at that time, sort of smugly raised my hand and I said, that's easy for you to say, you've won 21 Wimbledon titles. (laughs) And her answer was, but that's just why you should believe me, because I've been to the top of the mountain and I've seen all the trophies lying around. They're not that important. Hmm. The The winning is great. It's a big part of the game. But finding the balance between results and the process is the real key. Interesting. We have a couple callers on the line. I'm going to just see if they have questions for you. Our first caller is area code 415-640. Are you there? Caller 415-640. Did you have a question? And They may just be listening. All right, let me check our second one. We have a caller from... Two zero three eight six one. Did you have a question for Bob? Okay, again, I guess they're just listening to the show. That's awesome. Um, we've got one more here. Seven seven zero eight five six. Did you have a question? Caller seven seven zero eight five six. Nope. All right. Well, back to our conversation then, Bob. Um, I wanted to ask you when you're working with junior tennis players. How do you deal with the challenges of us tennis parents? Well, (laughs) I've been doing this a long time, and I have gotten to a point where sometimes I will cut somebody loose because I have a parent that pretty much is insisting that they know better. Mm -hmm. And I do think that parents know their kids pretty well, for sure. But I think that with the exception of some tennis parents who are actually competitive players or competitive in some area of their life they don't really know better and I and I really I do when meeting with 
with a kid, I meet with the parents at the same time for the first session. And I I really address the idea with the parents that their job is mostly to be proud of their of their kids for competing. Competing is very hard, especially for juniors. It's a very, very difficult experience, especially for those kids, most of whom are coached all the time. Then we throw them out there into this cauldron of competition, and they're alone, and they need to figure out things on their own, and they need to deal with disappointment, and they need to deal with even doing really well. And that experience that they're out there going through is one that our parents should be very, very proud of. There are so many kids that are home playing video games or not really involving themselves in something that's this difficult. So, um, look, there are times I'll say to a parent, I really don't think that I can work with, with your family. You're, you're just too stubborn about it. And you're, you're interfering in a way that at least I think is counterproductive for the ultimate performance of your own child, even though you're doing it out of love. I had one dad in particular as an example who the, his son had said to me, I feel so much pressure when my dad is there, I end up playing worse. So I told the dad that. I mean, I asked the kid first, can I tell your dad? Sure. I told the dad, and he said, well, that's ridiculous. He's got to get over it. <laughs> and I agreed. He does have to get over it, but you're so hooked into wanting him to do better why can't you do the thing that will help him do better in the short term, which is don't go watch him. Mm -hmm. You're making it more difficult. That's sad, though. It is sad, but there are a lot of... There are so many sad, tragic stories in junior tennis. It's, um, it's, It's really... It's pathetic, almost, that that... So many of our parents, I'm not calling the parents pathetic, but so many of the parents think they know the right thing. But an interesting thing is that, um, you know, junior, young adults, kids that are 14, 15, 16, and 17, part of their function in growing up is to become independent of their parents and to spend a lot of time thinking that their parents don't know what they're talking about. That's part of what happens in the teen years. And so when a parent might say something that's even a good idea about tennis, like, look, in between the points, you should take deep breaths. The kid's relationship with the parent is to not believe the parent knows what they're talking about. So they're going to discount even good advice. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, the negative to that is that if, if their coach says, you should take deep breaths, kid may already think it's a bad idea because their <laughs> parents suggested it. Right. So mostly, and I think, you know, Wayne Bryan says it so well. He says, when a match is over, just say to your kid, pasta or pizza? We just spent the whole day watching you play tennis. We're not talking about your tennis anymore. Right, right. Well, and it's tricky. I mean, as a parent, you know, we walk a fine line. And, I, you know, some of my most rewarding parenting moments have come very recently when my son has come back to me and said, now I understand why you told me X, Y, or Z. <laughs> you know? Right. And right. at 17, that's just starting to happen every now and then. And it's it's a really good feeling. And, you know, I have to resist the urge to say, see, 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 I told you I knew what I was talking about, you know. and Good and, idea to resist that urge. <laughs> well, it's hard, believe me. It is hard, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, but your son, is, your son is 17, right? Correct. So he's, yeah. um, you know, a little bit more mature and, you know, maybe a little bit more self-aware and has been down the road with you for a lot of years at this point. The right. kids who are 14 and 15 have a ways to go. And, you know, that's part of where they are developmentally. And that's right. why they're not that, that great at competing, because they are 14 and 15. Right. Well, so how do you explain the ones that don't seem to get derailed by that? 
there are kids that don't get derailed. And I just, I'm always curious how they manage to escape that. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think that, you know, good parenting has a lot to do with it. Good role models have a lot to do with it. You know, the kids that, the kids that, uh, that watch Nadal and get who he is, you know, really, if you ask, why do you like Nadal? And they talk about, well, in his interviews, he talks about, like, loving the battle and that every every point matters so much and I don't take anything lightly. The kids that address that are, you know, in some ways, they, they're a little bit more evolved. They're a little older than their age. Um, they've, they've, they've had a sense somewhere of some sort of process. And they're they're more rare. I mean, it's a smaller percentage, but it's a gift when you meet these kids because I learn from these kids. They, I really do. I mean, I, I'm in amazement when I work with a kid who really does seem to to get it, to get what it's about, and is patient in the process and, you know, doesn't get too excited about the wins and doesn't get too affected by the losses and just keeps working. Sometimes I think that, you know, there are kids that have have more vision, that they're much more targeted wow. in on what their their future is going to be in terms of playing that they they truly are gold in on bigger bigger victories in the future and they see that what they're doing right now is just helping them get there they're not as not as locked in on today's match being it's, it yeah i think it's hard um i know you know my son goes through periods of that where he just places so much importance on a particular match or a particular tournament. And, you know, my job, as I see it, is is to try to get him to focus on the bigger picture and, and recognize that one tournament is simply that. It's one tournament. There's another one next week if you want to play in it. And um, maybe you can, can talk to us a little bit about some tools that we as parents can use to help our kids stay focused on the bigger picture. Okay, well, <laughs> this is where storytelling comes in, I think. Well, good. Everybody, I hope we well, get there. <laughs> well, really, everybody has a story about their experience, say, as a, as a, as a tennis parent. The story might be, um, I want the best for my kid. I don't want my, my, my son or daughter to uh, be disappointed. I want them to succeed. Um I, I I only tell them things that help them. Um, you know some stories, and and you, and you you look at these stories, and you you ask them, or or for example, I get really anxious when my son or daughter competes, or I get really disappointed when she doesn't play to her level. So, when when parents tell me these stories, I always ask the same question about them: Is this story working for you? Is this story giving you what you want, which is for your son or daughter to have a great tennis experience, to really grow, to improve? And oftentimes when we break out the story, they'll say, well, no, it doesn't really work for me that I get really nervous, or it doesn't work for me that I speak to them after matches, or it doesn't really work for me that I, uh, that I, ex- that I exhibit frustration while they're playing, you know, slap my knee or, you know, roll my eyes. Because the kids see everything, on the you know they they know what their parents are doing a lot of the time, so that story, if it doesn't work, requires a new story. So a new story might be, I'm an extraordinary tennis parent who is proud that my son or daughter competes. I'm encouraging of them seeing losses as opportunities to really grow. I'm somebody who recognizes that that the process is way more important than the result at this point in their playing. So, you know, a better story then will contribute to like like sort of the steps to take will flow out of the better story. So, if the better story is that I welcome I welcome seeing my son or daughter being at, in adverse situations when competing. I welcome when the other parent is talking to the to their kid. I welcome that because 
My son and daughter will grow from it. Then they can sort of from that figure out what are they going to do? What are they really going to say to their son or daughter after a match? Um, what what are they going to say about feeling proud? Are they going to be genuine in 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 expressing that? Because I can tell you, I have adult kids. They're 40 and 35, and even as adults, it's remarkable to me how important it is that our children know how proud we are of them. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is just amazing. I mean, uh, no matter how old you are, your parents' uh, opinion of you becomes very, very, is always very important. So I would say the, the, the greatest tip for a parent is to continue to tell your kids how much you love them and how proud you are of them being competitors. That's a great that's tip. Like, yeah. I think that's my number one tip for parents usually. it's It usually involves a longer conversation, but that's what it always comes down to. Interesting. Well, so when you're working with kids, how how do you get them to reach down deep and and achieve their potential, whatever that is? When I meet with with a young player, I sit with them and I say to them, "So tell me about your tennis." And usually, they'll tell me about their their difficulties. You know, I feel pressure when I play somebody better than me. Um, I have difficulty closing it out. Um, when I'm not doing well, I get frustrated. Um, I get nervous before matches. Um, you know, they, they tell me the things that they really know are not so much good about what they do. They don't usually say, well, I have a really good forehand or my footwork's great. I mean, maybe because they're with me and they say, I guess my job is to tell you what I'm not good at. And, and right. that's fine. So they tell me that. And basically, you know, together we write these things down and we look at them and we call them your story. This is your story. Now, let's take those things and let's write a brand new story, a better story, a story of a new improved version of you. So if, if that story was Lisa's story, and that's, that's Lisa 1.0, we're going to write a story about who Lisa 2.0 could be or will be. Somebody who is, for example, based on that story, somebody who is uh, a master of managing nerves. I'm somebody who turns frustration into challenge. I'm somebody who is um, not concerned about who my opponents are. All of my opponents are faceless opponents. Now, those are just several examples of a new story, a better story, that becomes a story of somebody who... Lisa may aspire to be. And then Lisa has to read that story a lot because when you write that story, that's not who you are. But it is the story of will be, it's the story of can be, it's the story of let me get on the pathway to that. And often when kids write their new story, they conclude their new story by writing, I can't wait to be this new Lisa. Hmm. Then... What do we do? We take one part of it. We say, okay, you're somebody who gets nervous before matches. That's your old story. Your new story is you're a master of managing nerves. Okay, so what can we get to work on so that you become somebody who's a master of managing nerves? And we'll talk about, well, you know, nerves. Nerves manifest themselves in several ways. Muscle tension and shallow breathing. Can you start practicing on a daily basis stretching in order to be able to relax muscles, but also practice taking deep breaths during the day. Not in the middle of tennis, but daily. Once once every hour, take two or three deep breaths, so you become a master of deep breaths in the event that you do get anxious. What they've done is they've taken some steps away from the old story in the direction of the new story. And every single part of the new story can be dealt with in that way. Everything is trainable. I mean, part of my concept is that almost everything that we do, say, feel, think, is a habit. Mm -hmm. And we can create new habits. I mean, you can't take on too many at once. But, I mean, Lisa, for you, you're a tennis player. 
how hard would it be for you to dedicate yourself to taking ritualistically three deep breaths um, four times a day, just picking a number, every single day. And that eventually, by you practicing it, it becomes part of who you are, so that when you're playing, you're doing it in between every point, in between your points, even if you don't need it. And then what you've done is you've managed to intervene with nervousness. You've intercepted it. Nervousness becomes something that fades away. It comes up again. Of course, it comes up again in a bigger situation. But now you've developed a tool because you're this new person who's a master of managing nerves. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that. I mean, and and honestly, I mean, that specific skill is something that I've gained through my yoga practice. And, you know, it it is something that has translated into my tennis. And, and I love that. But... Um, you know, to be able to teach a child to do that, gosh, you know, I wish I had learned it when I was 12 instead of 50. <laughs> yeah, me too. But you learned it at 50, and that's fine. And there are plenty of things that I've learned later also. But that's fine. That's where I am right now. It's right. It, When you learn it, it's fine. I mean, it's great to learn it sooner. And we do have these tools out there for kids right now, and they are learning about them. Kids are learning to deep breathe, uh, breathe deeply. I never learned that when I played when I was younger. Never. Never. Mm-hmm. But now I do it. I'd like to share with you a story, one of these stories. Um, I think that it would really be helpful for the people listening because this is a story of a kid who was already very good in her sport. She was, she was one of these runners, and she was one of the best in the state, Uh, at middle distance running when she was a senior in high school. But when she came to me, she had just had a terrible result in the, uh, in the, what's called the Milrose Game Mile, which is at Madison Square Garden. Top 16 kids were running this mile. So she was already very good. And basically what her mom said when she called me was, she just ran this race, 16 kids. It's a mile race. She was so bad, she came in two miles behind everybody else obviously an exaggeration, but she was the kid, if you've ever seen a race where everybody finishes, and Mm -hmm. then 40 seconds later you see one kid running behind the field, that was her. So when I met with her, um, so I'm going to share with you parts of her story. One is, this is what she told me, I get very nervous on days leading up to the race, so much so that I feel I want the race to be canceled. Um, I experience self-doubt and low confidence and have thoughts of stopping. I race in fear that I'm not as good as my competitors. I put pressure on myself. Um, I feel like I haven't lived up to my potential in running. I lose a lot of energy before races. I panic in races. Even if I have a great race, I usually am sick afterwards. And I would, when she told me this, and there was way more in it, I said to her, like, how do you even run? (laughs) How can you be such a good runner when you're carrying around this kind of of these ankle weights and this static in your brain. And then she quickly, within several days, wrote a new story, and her new story was, all races are the same for me. I get excited and eager on days leading up to my races. These feelings escalate as I get closer to the race. My races are special moments and great opportunities. The worst pain for me comes from not confronting the difficulties in the race. I know who I am. I know who I am as a runner and I'm confident what I can do. I'd rather lose and compete great gutting it out than win and not compete well. I don't worry about other competitors. I deserve to be racing at a high level. My mental fitness equals and often exceeds my physical fitness. People who watch me race will say I run bravely with lots of guts. They'll say I'm a fierce competitor. I run with all my heart and leave the track with no regrets. I can't wait to be this new person. So think about like how inspirational that story is to her Mm -hmm. when she wrote this story and put it up on her bulletin board and when she read it to herself every morning she would get excited and she would start doing those things that would help her get closer to this new story well p.s the end of that year her senior year in high school she won the national scholastic mile that wasn't even her main event she won it now, she's at a, one of the top track universities in the country. She's a sophomore. 
she just took second place in the Junior World Championships. That's running with Olympic athletes. Wow. She's going to be in the She will be in the Olympics. So, you know, hopefully if she's okay physically for the next couple of years. So this is the power of these stories. You write a great story, you're on your way to all kinds of success. Wow. That's awesome. Oh, I'm telling you, I've read that story to thousands of people, talks that I've given all around the country, and people are like, their jaw drops open. I mean, people are saying, I want to be like her. (laughs) And by the way, she, I mean, she is really bought in to the idea of story writing. She writes a new story every Sunday about some part of her that she knows can be a better version of herself. So when I say, you know, Lisa 1.0 and Lisa 2.0, this kid is up to like 10.0 in in new stories. She's got another new story every time I talk to her. Well, in addition to writing those stories, I mean, do you see that then these kids tend to change the way they practice? Um, I mean, what... It's obviously got to be an impetus for change in other areas, and I'm just wondering what you see there. Well, it depends on what what they've put into their new story. If their new story is that they, the new story is I'm an extraordinary competitor who competes at the high end of my talent and skill, then when they're out practicing and in turn uh, playing, they're doing those things that they have defined as being an extraordinary competitor. So an extraordinary competitor might be somebody who's a who who accepts accepts what's going on with dignity and class. So mm-hmm. when they're practicing, if things aren't going well, they accept it. It doesn't mean they like it, it doesn't mean they become passive, but they're developing this incredible incredible spiritual skill of acceptance of what is, which frees them up to solve problems, which frees them up to go forward. So, you know, each and every athlete is very different in how they uh, how they use their story and what they write as their story. Um, mm-hmm. But they, they change in that they start to become this new person. Right, right. It, is that not specific enough? Did you have a more specific no, question on that? No, that's good. I I mean, it kind of leads me to my next question, which is, so, I mean, obviously there there has to be something in these kids that warrants you working with them. What what are you looking for in the in the players that you choose to work with? And and is there something that you're looking for in the in the whole family or just the athlete, him or herself? And then how do you deal with us parents um, when we say, we we got this, we, we know what to do here? How do you deal with that as a coach? Well, I'm not really all that selective. When the kids come to me, then I, I go to where they are. I mean, wherever they are, I mean, some of them are decent players, some of them are great players, and some of them are are really interested and some aren't. But, you know, I always start off by going to where they are. And that's, you know, in talking to them, they tell me their story of where they are. So I don't make any sort of distinctions. I'm always trying to get somebody from where they are to where they want to go to. So... Um, I don't know what the character of a kid is for a long time, you know, until I see what kind of effort they put in to trying to live the new story. Um, And as far as parents go, I mean, if the parents believe that mental training can be helpful, then to me that's, that's a good family to be working with. If there's skepticism, a lot of skepticism, then I talk to the parents about it's important that you don't let your skepticism sort of uh, infect your your child. I mean, if you're skeptical, that's fine. You're not the one working with me. But if you want the benefit of mental training, then in the same way you're telling your kids, spend a lot of time on the court, that's going to make a difference. You're helping them understand that. You have to say that mental training can make a difference too. 
And, and I think that, you know, some of the parents, honestly, Lisa, they they come from mental training because they say, my kid is a mental case, so my kid melts down, and my kid can't do this, that, or the other thing. So they're always trying to fix something that's broken. But mental training is not necessarily to fix what's broken. It's to it's to train somebody in one of the aspects of the game that's generally undertrained. There's no shortage of training on the court. There's a little bit of shortage in training in the gym, fitness-wise, but that's coming up. And frankly, mental training is um, it's becoming more and more prevalent. And mm-hmm. I think that uh, the great thing about mental training, though, Lisa, is that it goes way beyond the game. And it really it it teaches kids things that um, that they really are going to use their whole life. I, that sounds a little boilerplate, but it really is true. I mean, if a kid learns how to manage nerves, that goes way beyond the tennis court. If a kid learns how to uh, push through and welcome welcome and push through adversity, boy, that's a life skill that's that's really worth getting early uh, because we're all faced with difficulties. And and the tennis becomes much easier. So, you know, I think when the parents come and say, you know, I want you to help my kid win, you know, I challenge them and say winning comes in many forms. You know, if they grow, if they evolve, if they become better human beings, those wins are much more valuable than the wins in tennis. And, you know, Jim Lair, uh, he always says, you know, first, if you come to me, I'm going to work on you as a person first and a tennis player second. Absolutely. So some parents would not send their kid there. Right. They just well, wouldn't. I was so say, I mean, there, you have to have come up against some pushback on that because I know a lot of parents who it is about the wins on the tennis court. And, I, you know, so so if you got a kid like that, and let's say it's a two-parent family, and you've got one parent who is supporting the work their child's going to do with you, and you've got the other one saying, you know, this is a bunch of hooey, how do you reconcile that in the family? I work with the kid. I keep working with the kid. And I, I, know I try and build up a relationship with the kid where they feel, you know, uh, an, an element of trust with me, that I'm, I'm working for them. And I often say that uh, to young players. I say, I'm working for you. I'm working for you to help you get what you want. And I hang in there until the parents fire me or let me keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't really fuss around with the parents all that much. I mean every now and then I'll have a sit down with somebody and say, Look, you're not helping and they're either gonna listen to me or not. But I continue to work hard with the kids until they basically say, I don't want to work with Bob anymore. And mm. thankfully that really doesn't happen very often. Well that's good. I mean I'm I'm that's very good. persistent. I'm very persistent <laughs> in case you haven't noticed. I'm really I got that from I, you. <laughs> Yeah, and and look, I've really I think I model uh a certain amount of success because there are a lot of things that I've put out in front of me and have accomplished them. Mm. And and you know, and and I'm no different than a lot of other people. You know, as Jim Lair once said to me, you know, you were number one in the world, but you're the same gene pool as everybody else. Anybody else could be number one in the world if they do a lot of things that you have done. Not me specifically, but you know, we look at our our world champions and think there's something really different. And they are. They're different in the way they go about things. They're different in the things that they choose to focus on, and they may be different in their persistence, but they're still people. Same gene pool. Sure. Have you ever There's had a reason? A... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I mean, Michael Jordan was an unbelievable basketball player, but he wasn't physically a hundred percent better than everybody else in the league. But he brought a certain amount of mental, emotional, spiritual energy to to that game when he participated that made him so much better than everybody else. But physically, he wasn't that different. Mm-hmm. And and look, Nadal is very skilled. Federer is very skilled. There's no question about it. But when you watch Federer play Nadal yesterday, the difference was not physical skills. The difference was, you know, what was talked about a lot, 
maybe this, this little issue of doubt that's going on for Federer. Too many stories being written for him. He's got a good story going, but boy, everybody else has got a bad story about Federer right now. Yeah. True. True. Well, so I'm I'm just curious. Have you ever had a situation where the child's tennis coach, on court coach, has not supported the child's work with you? You might think this is peculiar, but a lot of times the parents don't tell the on-court coach that the, that their son or daughter is working with a mental coach. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little peculiar. But, um, I mean, it is because you would think you all would work together as a team. You would think that. <laughs> you would think that. But somehow they feel like they're they're not being loyal. Um so, I mean, generally speaking, I'll say to the parents, I'm going to interact with the coach. But there might be a coach that is very, um, I don't know, maybe they they think that they know all the parts of the game, and that comes through to the parents, and the parents are concerned about irritating them. So, again, like I say, I work with the, I work with the player. I'm always working with the player. I don't ever say anything about the on-court coach. I don't really talk to the kids about their technique and their strategy. I'm talking to them about something else entirely. Is I mean, it some of the pressure parents... on the kid though. If if the kid knows that the on-court coach is it's kind of being, you know, kept secret that the kid's working with you. I think that's a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing, but it's not really for me to force the parents to. Uh, address that. I mean, I would, I, I tell them to do that, but if they don't want to do it, they don't do it. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to throw the, the player under a bus and not work with them. Right. It may make it a little more difficult for me, but I have total loyalty to the kids that I'm working with. I, I am there to help them in every single way that I can, with the skills that I have in my particular area. Not every situation is a great situation. Hmm. But, you know, the kid, I, I do believe in my heart that the kids that work with me, they trust where I'm coming from. I'm not competing with their coach. I mean, I'll tell them that. I'm not competing with your coach. Your coach is great. You're a good player. You've got good skills. You know how to hit the ball. That's really good. I'm going to help you so that you can use the skills that you've developed. That's my job. Hmm. Interesting. And do you so, watch them on the court? Do you ever watch them uh, compete? I do sometimes. I do sometimes. But even there, I would rather the the player become good at being able to describe their experience on the court. Yes. Because most of the kids... When their coaches watch them, their coaches then tell them what they did right, what they did wrong, what they could have done, what they should have done, and they're basically uncoaching them in self-reliance. Being aware is a huge, important part of being a great tennis player. Being, when I sit down with a kid and I say, so what happened out there? I don't know. I said, you don't know? I said, you've got to get better at knowing. Mm -hmm. So next time you play a match, when you're done and you talk to me, give me one thing that you know happened out there. Tell me, like, you know, I lost faith or I quit on myself. Don't tell me what somebody else has told you. Tell me what you know. And if they get better at self-awareness, they become much better competitors because you have to be self-aware when you're out there competing. You have to know what's going on so that you can make adjustments. But again, you know, and going back to the first question about the model, most of coaching is done in a way that sort of addresses you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, almost on the assumption that that will make a child improve. There's very little, this is what you did well. You did this well, you did that well, so that they can build on what they do well. And by coaches always telling the kids 
what they did wrong, whether it's in the lesson or even after a match, they're not letting the kids develop a really important part of their game, which is how to fix themselves. Okay. It irks me. Believe me, I'm on the court next to lessons often when I just go out and play. And it really, really bothers me when I hear a coach, after a kid hits the ball in the net, say to them, you lift it up, or you didn't stay down enough. I'd much rather hear a coach say, what happened there? Mm-hmm. And not be okay with a kid to say, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a good answer. It's not a good answer. No, it's not. Well, Billie Jean it's... King worked with you know Billie Jean King worked with Andre Agassi for a while when the, when Andre was really down low in the rankings, and he she said to him, "I'm going to watch you play, and every now and then I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you in the point or after a point. And I'm going to say, why did you hit that shot? And there are two answers you can't give me. There are two answers that are not okay. One is, I don't know. And the other is, I felt like it. <laughs> you give me an answer. I want to know you've got a purpose behind that shot. And when you know you have a purpose, or you can give me the reason that you've chosen a shot, I know you're getting better. And I think that that's something that, you know, again, we need to be teaching our kids. They're way too dependent on us, you know, in these lessons. A quiet wow. lesson would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, you're talking about developing tennis IQ, and you're right. I mean, when a kid, all they do is drill or have a lesson, they don't learn that. They don't learn, you know, the purpose of specific shots. Why Why do I need to hit the ball there with this type of spin in this moment? And, um... That's a very interesting point, actually. Well, they, I, may, they may hear it. They may be told it, and I think that's good. They may have to hear it the first time or the second time, but they shouldn't hear it every time that they don't hit that shot. The question, the manner of asking the question might be a, a more, a, an equally effective or maybe more effective way to get them to learn it. Like, what do you need to do next time in that situation? You know, right. hopefully the answer has to do with what the coach taught them initially. Oh, because if I give it more spin and hit to that spot, I'm going to create a better opportunity on my next shot, or whatever the answer is. Right. They need to come up with these answers, and we need to train them in answering the question, not in us just feeding them the answer. In Very school, you don't. In school, they don't do that. They don't feed you the answer. They ask you the question in the test. And you have to answer it based on what you've learned. But the test in tennis is the the match. Of course, nobody else can answer it, but all the practice sessions, the coaches are answering the questions for the kids. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. There are a lot of great coaches out there. But the best coaches often are saying the least. Paul Anacombe, he's he's a quiet coach. He's had some success. He worked with Sampras and Federer. He's a very, very quiet coach. Yeah, I've loved his commentary during the year in championships, too. He's been really good. Oh, boy, I'll tell you. He said that one thing that I I put on my blog that was just fantastic about confidence. Yeah. Which was, I mean, for those people that are listening that didn't hear it, Jimmy Arias, and the other broadcaster, they were all over this loss of confidence that Federer has. He's lost confidence. He's lost confidence. And Anacone said, "It's it's not so much that he lost confidence. It's that in some way, he's forgotten about the simplicity of the game. He's made it more complex than it is. The doubt has made him start to question a little bit of what he's doing." And then he starts to do things that he doesn't really need to do. He goes for more shots when he doesn't need to. So it's not that he loses confidence. He loses clarity. Clarity and simplicity. The game of tennis is a fairly simple game, but we keep it simple. And the more layers of complexity we add to it, the more difficulty we have. The game basically is 
if you if you really reduce the game to its most simple things, it's about putting the ball in the court into areas of the court that make it slightly more difficult for your opponent. That's really what we're trying to do. And when we make it more complex than that, it gets much more difficult. Interesting. Well, hey, since you so there's something, the, go there's ahead. something else I, w- I wanted to address also that I think can be helpful that has to do with uh, tips, tips, specific instructions, and so forth. Okay. We don't have a shortage of good tips. Like somebody once called me up and said, like, can you give me, like, your two best mental training tips? And I said, two? I can give you, like, a thousand good mental training tips. <laughs> They're all good ones. And you can go to any number of coaches. You can read books. You can re- watch videos or, or DVRs. You can watch so much stuff, read stuff. There are great tips. It's not really about the tips. It's about when you hear a good tip. Like, let's say it's it's a good tip to uh, take deep breaths. That's a great tip. Right. Right? Okay. Right. So yeah. people say, oh, yeah, that's, that's a great tip. Okay. So everything about that tip for it to become effective has to do with diligent practice. That somebody needs to practice that enough in a forced way until it starts to become part of who the player really is, until it becomes such a habit that they don't have to try to do it. Tips are really great when they become part of who you are. If you have to try to do them, then there's still too much distance between who you are and what that tip is. Mm. Does that make sense? Is that too, like, vague? No, it makes total sense. So until it becomes habit, you're saying, then until it's it separate it, from you. It's separate from you. And then you have to try to remember to do it. Right. And look, in the midst of competition, it's hard to remember to do certain things that we know are good to do. Right. So when somebody gets a good tip, that's worth devoting themselves to over and over again until it becomes part of who they are. I have a friend who every single day on Facebook, he posts a great quote. You know how people do that a lot? A great quote. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. Up. Okay, well, then don't take this personally, but here's what I say. If <laughs> those quotes resonate for you, and they obviously do, which one of them resonates so much that you want it to become who you are, not just an idea that's in your head? Pick it and live it. Every single day, every hour of the day, try to live that quote. If you live it every day, over and over again, it starts to become part of who you are. And then you or I can become like one of my favorite, favorite people to read about is Gandhi, who said, who I am, what I do, what I believe, is all the same. There's no disconnect between the things that I believe, the things that I say, and who I am. How great would that be? To yeah. be that way. Yeah, so I aspire to be like that that's, in every way. Well, I think that's a great uh, a great place to end our show today, or end our conversation. The The whole idea of becoming your favorite quote and living it minute by minute, day by day until it becomes part of who we are. I I love that idea. And um, I want to just say thank you to you, Bob, for coming on today and sharing your experience and your wisdom with us. And I I want to just remind our listeners that Bob and it's called Live the Best Story of Your Life, A World Champion's Guide to Lasting Change. Of course, it will be on ParentingAces.com, on our books page, and as soon as it's published. But in the meantime, Bob, how can people find you? You can find me on my, find me on my website, which is LiveTheBestStoryOfYourLife.com, or if you want an easier one, just go to BobLitwin.com. Um, and all of my contact information is there. Um happy to, you know, take emails from people. I respond to everybody pretty quickly. And, look, it's my life is all about 
trying to help people become the best that they can be at what they're doing. So it's a gift for me when people reach out to me. Well, we appreciate you and appreciate the gift you give back. And um, to those of you listening, I hope you've enjoyed the hour. Bob, have a great rest of your Monday, and I'll see all of you next week at ParentingAces.com. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's been a pleasure. I wish we had 10 hours. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Have a great day. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye.